Section 22 of Lives of Eminent Philosophers, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Marcus Scherer. Lives of Eminent Philosophers, Volume 1, by Diogenes Laertius. Translated by Robert Drew Hicks. Book 2, Chapter 5. Socrates. Socrates was the son of Sophroniscus, a sculptor, and of Phaenarete, a midwife, as we read in the Theaetetus of Plato. He was a citizen of Athens and belonged to the deme Alopis. It was thought that he helped Euripides to make his plays. Hence, Nesimachus writes, This new play of Euripides is the Phrygians, and Socrates provides the wood for frying. And again he calls Euripides, an engine riveted by Socrates, and Callias in the captives. Pray, why so solemn? Why this lofty air? I've every right. I'm helped by Socrates. Aristophanes in The Clouds. Tis he composes for Euripides, those clever plays, much sound and little sense. According to some authors, he was a pupil of Anaxagoras, and also of Daemon, as Alexander states in his Successions of Philosophers. When Anaxagoras was condemned, he became a pupil of Archelaus the physicist. Aristoxenus asserts that Archelaus was very fond of him. Durus makes him out to have been a slave, and to have been employed on stonework, and the draped figures of the graces on the Acropolis have by some been attributed to him. Hence the passage in Timon's Sili. From these diverged the sculptor, a praetor about laws, the enchanter of Greece, inventor of subtle arguments, the sneerer who mocked at fine speeches, half attic in his mock humility. He was formidable in public speaking, according to Idomeneus. Moreover, as Xenophon tells us, the Thirty forbade him to teach the art of words. And Aristophanes attacks him in his plays, for making the worse appear the better reason. For Favorinus, in his miscellaneous history, says Socrates and his pupil Eschines were the first to teach rhetoric, and this is confirmed by Idomeneus in his work on the Socratic Circle. Again, he was the first who discoursed on the conduct of life, and the first philosopher who was tried and put to death. Aristoxenus, the son of Spintheris, says of him that he made money. He would at all events invest sums, collect the interest, accruing, and then, when this was expanded, put out the principal again. Demetrius relates that Crito removed him from his workshop and educated him, being struck by his beauty of soul, that he discussed moral questions in the workshops and the marketplace, being convinced that the study of nature is no concern of ours, and that he claimed that his inquiries embraced whatsoever is good or evil in a house, that frequently, owing to his vehemence in an argument, men set upon him with their fists, or tore his hair out, and that for the most part he was despised and laughed at, yet bore all this ill usage patiently. So much so, that when he had been kicked, and someone expressed surprise at his taking it so quietly, Socrates rejoined, Should I have taken the law of a donkey, supposing that he had kicked me? Thus far Demetrius. Unlike most philosophers, he had no need to travel, except when required to go on an expedition. The rest of his life he stayed at home and engaged all the more keenly in argument with anyone who would converse with him, his aim being not to alter his opinion, but to get at the truth. They relate that Euripides gave him the treatise of Heraclitus and asked his opinion on it, and that his reply was, The part I understand is excellent, and so too is, I dare say, the part I do not understand, but it needs a Delian diver to get to the bottom of it. He took care to exercise his body, and kept in good condition. At all events, he served on an expedition to Amphipolis, and when in the Battle of Delium, Xenophon had fallen from his horse, he stepped in and saved his life. For in the general flight of the Athenians, he personally retired at his ease, quietly turning round from time to time and ready to defend himself in case he were attacked. Again he served at Potidaea, whither he had gone by sea, as land communications were interrupted by the war. And while there, he is said to have remained a whole night without changing his position, and to have won the prize of valor. But he resigned it to Alcibiades, for whom he cherished the tenderest affection according to Aristippus in the fourth book of his treatise On the Luxury of the Ancients. Ion of Chios 
relates that in his youth he visited Samos in the company of Archelaus, and Aristotle that he went to Delphi. He went also to the Isthmus, according to Favorinus in the first book of his memorabilia. His strength of will and attachment to democracy are evident from his refusal to yield to Critias and his colleagues when they ordered him to bring the wealthy Leon of Salamis before them for execution, and further from the fact that he alone voted for the acquittal of the ten generals, and again from the facts that when he had the opportunity to escape from the prison, he declined to do so, and that he rebuked his friends for weeping over his fate, and addressed to them his most memorable discourses in the prison. He was a man of great independence and dignity of character. Pamphila, in the seventh book of her Commentaries, tells how Alcibiades once offered him a large site on which to build a house. But he replied, Suppose then I wanted shoes, and you offered me a whole hide to make a pair with. Would it not be ridiculous in me to take it? Often, when he looked at the multitude of wares exposed for sale, he would say to himself, How many things I can do without? And he would continually recite the lines, the purple robe and silver shine more fits an actor's need than mine. He showed his contempt for Archelaus of Macedon, and Scopus of Cranon, and Eurylochus of Larissa, by refusing to accept their presence, or to go to their court. He was so orderly in his way of life, that on several occasions, when pestilence broke out in Athens, he was the only man who escaped infection. Aristotle says that he married two wives. His first wife was Xanthippe, by whom he had a son, Lamprocles. His second wife was Myrto, the daughter of Aristides the Just, whom he took without a dowry. By her he had Sophroniscus and Menexenus. Others make Myrto his first wife, while some writers, including Satyrus and Hieronymus of Rhodes, affirm that they were both his wives at the same time. For they say that the Athenians were short of men, and wishing to increase the population, passed a decree permitting a citizen to marry one Athenian woman and have children by another, and that Socrates accordingly did so. He could afford to despise those who scoffed at him. He prided himself on his plain living, and never asked a fee from anyone. He used to say that he enjoyed the food which was least in need of condiment, and the drink which made him feel the least hankering for some other drink, and that he was nearest to the gods and that he had the fewest wants. This may be seen from the comic poets who in the act of ridiculing him gave him the highest praise. Thus Aristophanes. O man that justly desirest great wisdom, how blessed will be thy life amongst Athenians and Greeks, retentive of memory and thinker that thou art, with endurance of toil for thy character. Never art thou weary, whether standing or walking, never numb with cold, never hungry for breakfast, from wine and from gross feeding, and all other frivolities thou dost turn away. Amipsius too, when he puts him on the stage wearing a cloak, says, You come to join us, Socrates, worthiest of a small band and emptiest by far. You're a robust fellow. Where can we get you a proper coat? Your sorry plight is an insult to the cobblers. And yet, hungry as he is, this man has never stooped to flatter. This disdainful lofty spirit of his is also noticed by Aristophanes when he says, because you stalk along the streets, rolling your eyes, and endure, barefoot, many a hardship, and gaze up at us, the clouds. And yet, at times, he would even put on fine clothes to suit the occasion, as in Plato's Symposium, where he is on his way to Agathon's house. He showed equal ability in both directions, in persuading and dissuading men. Thus, after conversing with Thetatus about knowledge, he sent him away, as Plato says, fired with a divine impulse. But when Euthyphro had indicted his father for manslaughter, Socrates, after some conversation with him upon piety, diverted him from his purpose. Lysis, again, he turned by exhortation into a most virtuous character, for he had the skill to draw his arguments from facts. And when his son Lamprocles was violently angry with his mother, Socrates made him feel ashamed of himself, as I believe Xenophon has told us. When Plato's brother Glaucon was desirous of entering upon politics, Socrates dissuaded him, as Xenophon relates, because of his want of experience. But on the contrary, he encouraged Charmides to take up politics, because he had a gift that way. He aroused Iphicrates, the general, to a martial spirit by showing him how the fighting cocks of Midias the barber flapped their wings in defiance of those of Callias. Glauconides demanded that he should be acquired for the state, as if he were some pheasant or peacock. He used to say that it was strange, 
that if you asked a man how many sheep he had, he could easily tell you the precise number, whereas he could not name his friends, or say how many he had, so slight was the value he set upon them. Seeing Euclides keenly interested in heuristic arguments, he said to him, You will be able to get on with sophists, Euclides, but with men not at all. For he thought there was no use in this sort of hair-splitting, as Plato shows us in the Euthydemus. Again, when Charmides offered him some slaves in order that he might derive an income from them, he declined the offer, and according to some, he scorned the beauty of Alcibiades. He would extol leisure as the best of possessions, according to Xenophon, in the symposium. There is, he said, only one good, that is, knowledge, and only one evil, that is, ignorance. Wealth and good birth bring their possessor no dignity, but on the contrary, evil. At all events, when someone told him that an Athenian's mother was a Thracian, he replied, Nay, did you expect a man so noble to have been born of two Athenian parents? He made Crito ransom Phaedo, who, having been taken prisoner in the war, was kept in degrading slavery, and so won him for philosophy. Moreover, in his old age, he learnt to play the lyre declaring that he saw no absurdity in learning a new accomplishment. As Xenophon relates in the symposium, it was his regular habit to dance, thinking that such exercise helped to keep the body in good condition. He used to say that his supernatural sign warned him beforehand of the future, that to make a good start was no trifling advantage, but a trifle turned the scale, and that he knew nothing except just the fact of his ignorance. He said that when people paid a high price for fruit, which had ripened early, they must despair of seeing the fruit ripen at the proper season. And being once asked in what consisted the virtue of a young man, he said, in doing nothing to excess. He held that geometry should be studied to the point at which a man is able to measure the land which he acquires or parts with. On hearing the line of Euripides' play Auge, where the poet says of virtue, "'Tis best to let her roam at will," he got up and left the theatre for he said it was absurd to make a hue and cry about a slave who could not be found, and to allow virtue to perish in this way. Someone asked him whether he should marry or not, and received the reply, Whichever you do, you will repent it. He used to express his astonishment that the sculptors of marble statues should take pains to make the block of marble into a perfect likeness of a man, and should take no pains about themselves, lest they should turn out mere blocks, not men. He recommended to the young the constant use of the mirror, to the end that handsome men might acquire a corresponding behavior, and ugly men conceal their defects by education. He had invited some rich men, and when Xanthippe said she felt ashamed of the dinner, never mind, said he, for if they are reasonable, they will put up with it, and if they are good for nothing, we shall not trouble ourselves about them. He would say that the rest of the world lived to eat, while he himself ate to live. Of the mass of men who do not count, he said it was as if one should object to a single tetradocum as counterfeit, and at the same time let a whole heap made up of just such pieces pass as genuine. Aeschines said to him, I am a poor man, and have nothing else to give, but I offer you myself. And Socrates answered, Nay, do you not see that you are offering me the greatest gift of all? To one who complained that he was overlooked when the thirty rose to power, he said, you are not sorry for that, are you? To one who said, You are condemned by the Athenians to die. He made answer, So are they by nature. But some ascribe this to Anaxagoras. When his wife said, You suffer unjustly, he retorted, Why, would you have me suffer justly? He had a dream that someone said to him, On the third day thou shalt come to the fertile fields of Phia. And he told Aeschines, On the third day I shall die. When he was about to drink the hemlock, Apollodorus offered him a beautiful garment to die in. What, said he, is my own good enough to live in but not to die in? When he was told that so-and-so spoke ill of him, he replied, True, for he has never learnt to speak well. When Antisthenes turned his cloak so that the terror in it came into view, I see, said he, your vanity through your cloak. To one who said, Don't you find so-and-so very offensive? His reply was, no, for it takes two to make a quarrel. We ought not to object, he used to say, to be subjects for the comic poets. For if they satirize our faults, they will do us good. And if not, they do not touch us. When Xanthippe first scolded him, and then drenched him with water, his rejoinder was, 
Did I not say that Xanthippe's thunder would end in rain? When Alcibiades declared that the scolding of Xanthippe was intolerable, Nay, I have got used to it, said he, as to the continued rattle of a windlass, and you do not mind the cackle of geese. No, replied Alcibiades, but they furnish me with eggs and goslings. And Xanthippe, said Socrates, is the mother of my children. When she tore his coat off his back in the marketplace, and his acquaintances advised him to hit back, Yes, by Zeus, said he, in order that while we are sparring, each of you may join in with, Go it, Socrates, well done, Xanthippe. He said he lived with a shrew, as horsemen are fond of spirited horses, but just as, when they have mastered these, they can easily cope with the rest. So I, in the society of Xanthippe, shall learn to adapt myself to the rest of the world. These, and the like, were his words and deeds, to which the Pythian priestess bore testimony when she gave Chaerophon the famous response, Of all men living, Socrates most wise. For this he was most envied, and especially because he would take to task those who thought highly of themselves, proving them to be fools. As to be sure, he treated Anitus, according to Plato's Mino. For Anitus could not endure to be ridiculed by Socrates, and so in the first place stirred up against him Aristophanes and his friends. Then afterwards he helped to persuade Miletus, to indict him on a charge of impiety and corrupting the youth. The indictment was brought by Miletus, and the speech was delivered by Polyuctus, according to Favorinus, in his miscellaneous history. The speech was written by Polycrates, the sophist, according to Hermippus, but some say that it was by Anitus. Lycon, the demagogue, had made all the needful preparations. Antisthenes, in his Successions of Philosophers, and Plato, in his Apology, say that there were three accusers, Anitus, Lycon, and Miletus, that Anitus was roused to anger on behalf of the craftsmen and politicians, Lycon, on behalf of the rhetoricians, Miletus, of the poets, all three of which were classes that had felt the lash of Socrates. Favorinus, in the first book of his Memorabilia, declares that the speech of Polycrates against Socrates is not authentic, for he mentions the rebuilding of the walls by Conon, which did not take place till six years after the death of Socrates. And this is the case. The affidavit in the case, which is still preserved, says Favorinus, in the Metron, ran as follows. This indictment and affidavit is sworn by Miletus, the son of Miletus of Pythos, against Socrates, the son of Sophronicus of Alopis. Socrates is guilty of refusing to recognize the gods recognized by the state, and of introducing other new divinities. He is also guilty of corrupting the youth. The penalty demanded his death. The philosopher then, after Lysias had written a defense for him, read it through and said, A fine speech, Lysias. It is not, however, suitable to me, for it was plainly more forensic than philosophical. Lysias said, If it is a fine speech, how can it fail to suit you? Well, he replied, would not fine raiment and fine shoes be just as unsuitable to me? Justice of Tiberius, in his book, entitled The Wreath, says that in the course of the trial, Plato mounted the platform and began, Though I am the youngest man of Athens, of all who ever rose to address you, whereupon the judges shouted out, Get down, get down. When, therefore, he was condemned by 281 votes more than those given for acquittal, and when the judges were assessing what he should suffer or what fine he should pay, he proposed to pay 25 drachmae. Eubulides, indeed, says he offered 100. When this caused an uproar among the judges, he said, Considering my services, I assess the penalty at maintenance in the pertanium at the public expense. Sentence of death was passed with an accession of eighty fresh votes. He was put in prison, and a few days afterward drank the hemlock, after much noble discourse which Plato records in the Phaedo. Further, according to some, he composed a pay in beginning. All hail Apollo, Delos Lord. Hail Artemis, ye noble pair. Dionysodorus denies that he wrote the paean. He also composed a fable of Aesop, not very skillfully, beginning... Judge not, ye men of Corinth, Aesop cried, of virtue as the jury courts decide. So he was taken from among men, 
and not long afterwards the Athenians felt such remorse that they shut up the trading grounds and gymnasia. They banished the other accusers, but put Miletus to death. They honored Socrates with a bronze statue, the work of Lysippus, which they placed in the hall of processions. And no sooner did Anitus visit Heraclea than the people of that town expelled him on that very day. Not only in the case of Socrates, but in very many others, the Athenians repented in this way. For they fined Homer, so says Heraclides, fifty drachmae for a madman, and said Tertaeus was beside himself, and they honored Astydamas before Aeschylus, and his brother poets with a bronze statue. Euripides upbraids them thus in his Palamedes. Ye have slain, have slain the all-wise, the innocent, the muses nightingale. This is one account, but Philochorus asserts that Euripides died before Socrates. He was born, according to Apollodorus in his chronology, in the archonship of Absephion, in the fourth year of the seventy-seventh Olympiad, on the sixth day of the month of Thargelion. When the Athenians purify their city, which according to the Delians is the birthday of Artemis, he died in the first year of the ninety-fifth Olympiad, at the age of seventy. With this, Demetrius of Phalerum agrees, but some say he was sixty when he died. Both were pupils of Anaxagoras, I mean Socrates and Euripides, who was born in the first year of the 75th Olympiad in the archonship of Caliades. In my opinion, Socrates discoursed on physics as well as on ethics, since he holds some conversations about providence, even according to Xenophon, who, however, declares that he only discussed ethics. But Plato, after mentioning Anaxagoras and certain other physicists in the Apology, treats for his own part themes which Socrates disowned, although he puts everything into the mouth of Socrates. Aristotle relates that a magician came from Syria to Athens, and among other evils with which he threatened Socrates, predicted that he would come to a violent end. I have written verses about him too, as follows. Drink, then, being in Zeus's palace, O Socrates, for truly did the god pronounce thee wise, being wisdom himself. For when thou didst frankly take the hemlock at the hands of the Athenians, they themselves drained it as it passed thy lips. He was sharply criticized, according to Aristotle, in his third book on poetry, by a certain Antilochus of Lemnos, and by Antiphon the soothsayer, just as Pythagoras was by Chilon of Croton, or as Homer was assailed in his lifetime by Syagoras, and after his death by Xenophanes of Colophon, so too Hesiod was criticized in his lifetime by Kirchops, and after his death by the aforesaid Xenophanes, Pindar by Empiphenes of Cos, Thales by Pherakides, Bias by Solaris of Prien, Pittacus by Antimonidas and Alcaeus, Anaxagoras by Sosibus, and Simonides by Tamocreon. Of those who succeeded him and were called Socratics, the chief were Plato, Xenophon, Antisthenes, and of ten names on the traditional list the most distinguished are Aeschines, Phaedo, Euclides, Aristippus. I must first speak of Xenophon. Antisthenes will come afterwards among the Cynics. After Xenophon, I shall take the Socratics proper, and so pass on to Plato. With Plato, the ten schools begin. He was himself the founder of the first academy. This, then, is the order which I shall follow. Of those who bear the name Socrates, there is one, a historian, who wrote a geographical work upon Argos, another, a peripatetic philosopher of Bithynia, a third, a poet who wrote epigrams, lastly, Socrates of Cos, who wrote on the names of the gods. End of section 22